All righty. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another virtual uh, star party here at the Dyer Observatory. Uh, tonight, we've got a bunch of great presenters from Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium, Rhodes College, the Memphis Astronomical Society, and the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. So we got a, a great program lined up. We're going to be looking or trying to look at some things that we haven't looked at before. And if we don't have clear skies, we're at least going to show you some uh, some images and talk about what we would be looking at tonight. Uh, so first, I want to also thank my colleagues uh, here at the Dyer Observatory, uh, Helen Morissette, Nathan Griffin, and Alex Rockefeller for helping to get these nights going. And also Brian Smokler of VU News and Communications, who, um, as I usually say, is the one that's making sure that um, our stream is getting out to you all tonight. Uh, a couple of reminders. Uh, first of all, um, if you're uh, since you're watching this on YouTube, uh, YouTube does have a chat feature, um, and we are encouraging, highly encouraging folks to ask questions as we go through our program tonight. As we go through these questions, or as we go through the program, if we aren't able to get to your question during a specific segment, we're going to make sure that we record that and uh, try to get to it at the end of the show, okay? So if we have a lot of questions, we're going to try to get through as many of those as we possibly can. Um, if you're on YouTube, uh, you have to be uh, logged in typically to do the chat, so make sure that you've done that. And if you're in full screen, you may not see that chat feature, so uh, just keep those items in mind. Uh, before we get started, um, I do have a couple of other little things that I wanted to show. Uh, first of all, if you go to the Dyer Observatory homepage, uh, dyer.vanderbilt.edu, uh, we have a couple of star charts uh, that will be featuring uh, some of the objects that we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, there's a really nice color version that looks great on a computer or a smart device, but if you want to print it out, we've got a version that doesn't use as much ink. So all of those are on the front page of our website for free to download. You can forward them on to your friends and family, and we encourage that highly, so uh, please use them as much as you like. Uh, in addition, uh, we've got a, um, a really nice uh, calendar on our website as well that our own Alex Rockefeller put together. It's absolutely chock full of information. It's got lots of images, lots of, of, of information. So uh, please download that and, and check out all of the, the different highlights for the month. And some of those, on, uh, those uh, events we're going to be talking about tonight. All righty, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So. The first present, uh, presentation we're going to be doing tonight is actually uh, kind of a tag team. Um, it's going to be myself here at the Vanderbilt Dyer Observatory. And then one of our presenters, uh, Mr. Jeremy Bildman, who is over in Memphis and is the president of the Memphis Astronomical Society. He's going to take the second half of the presentation. But the first things that we're going to be talking about uh, this evening are two bright planets that we can see in our evening sky. That is, we don't have those hazy clouds uh, in front of them right now. So let me do a, a screen share right quick. I'm going to use a program that we've used a number of times on uh, our virtual star parties, and that is a program called Stellarium. You can download it for free from stellarium.org. Uh, you can even get a version for your smart device now. So it's a great program, one of many great programs that you can download uh, for smart devices and one of the best, in my opinion, anyway, for uh, things like uh, uh, computers and laptops. But what we're seeing here is a virtual view of our sky over Nashville. If we didn't have any clouds to deal with, which unfortunately we do this evening, but if we had a good clear sky, this is essentially what we would be seeing. So the green area is representing the ground. And this view is basically like if I was uh, lying on my back looking straight up and my head was to the north, my feet were pointing to the south. First thing I would notice is a beautiful moon, which I hope that we're going to be able to, uh, to get to see this evening. Um, but over in the west, the sun has just set. There is a couple of objects that we're going to focus on over there. Um, now, what I'm going to do is rotate my view around. This is kind of like I'm standing up here and now I'm starting to look over towards the west. And I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. First thing you're going to notice is a bright spot. Looks like a, a nice bright star, especially as it starts to get darker, that, that object is going to get brighter and brighter. But that is the planet Venus, uh, what we often refer to as Earth's sister because of how similar in size it is. 
Uh, we're gonna hold off on Venus for the moment. Uh, Venus is pretty low right now. Um, even if we had a clear sky here at the observatory, I wouldn't be able to get it because it would already be in the trees. But the next time you have a good view of the, uh, the sun, or excuse me, the, um, the west-northwest horizon, go out uh, probably around this time and you'll start to see that really bright object. And we're gonna have it for the rest of the year. So it's always a treat to have uh, what a lot of people refer to as the evening star. Uh, in our sky. But again, we're going to hold off on that for just a moment. I'm going to search instead for another planet, which isn't quite as bright, but it's pretty darn close to Venus right now. And in fact, as we'll talk about, we may see it even closer in, uh, in the coming weeks. So I'm going to zoom in, ignore those little red lines around the planet, uh, that's just the program saying that it's selected uh, Venus, or excuse me, Mercury. But what we're seeing here is the planet Mercury. I'm actually going to unselect that. All righty. So one thing that you're going to notice is that you would expect with it being a planet, you'd expect to see this round object in your field of view. But in fact, Mercury looks like the moon, except it looks incredibly small in the telescope. But if you have a small backyard telescope and you can find Mercury, which it'll look like a kind of a faint star uh, in, the, in the dusky evening sky, uh, pretty close to Venus, you'll notice that it's got a nice crescent phase. And in fact, if I, um, if I select Mercury again and I go forward in time one week, I want you to notice two things. Oops, hold on. There we go. There's one week from now. So here's today, uh, here's one week from now. You'll notice that Mercury looks like a thinner crescent, but if you carefully watch, you'll notice that it's gotten a little bit bigger. And if we go a week farther, you notice that it's a super thin crescent and it appears to be getting closer to the sun and it appears to be a little bit larger. So the reason that it's going through these phases is because it orbits within the Earth's orbit. And what's actually happening is that Mercury has come around the sun and it's catching up to the earth in its orbit. And it's almost going to pass in front of the sun. It's not going to quite uh, get in front of the sun, uh, something uh, that we would call a transit, but it's gonna get pretty close to it. So it's physically getting closer to us and we're seeing more and more of the night side of it. And that's why we see these different changes, okay? Now I'm going to back out uh, a little bit here. And let's go down to Venus. In fact, let me just go ahead and have the program find it for us. All righty. So I'm going to go back to today. And if we zoom in on Venus, Venus, you notice it looks very round. Okay. But you notice that we're seeing a little bit of the night side up here. Venus is almost on the opposite side of the sun from us, but it's coming on around as well. So in the coming months, let's take a look at what's going to happen. So this is tonight. Uh, here's a week from now, two weeks, three weeks, four. I'm just going to keep going in time. And if you look carefully down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the date. So here's August 14th. Now here is October 2nd. Here is uh, November 13th. And then, oops. And now we see... Uh, Venus has gotten really large by the end of the year, and it's got this really beautiful crescent phase. So it's doing the same thing. It's coming on around. It's trying to come in between us and the sun and because it's getting physically closer to us. It appears larger over time, but also we're seeing more and more that night side because the other side of Venus that we aren't seeing, that's the side that's mostly facing the sun. Okay, so over the coming months, and again, we're going to have um, uh, Venus through the end of the year. Uh, take a look at it. You don't have to have a huge telescope. Use a small telescope, uh, a pair of binoculars, especially if you can put those on a tripod or, or steady your arms. You'll be able to see that crescent phase really well. All righty. So I'm going to end there and I'm going to kick it over to Jeremy Bellman over in Memphis. And again, he is president of the Memphis Astronomical Society. He's going to tell us a little bit more about what to look for with Mercury and Venus in the coming months. So Jeremy, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Billy. Great discussion. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to we're going to talk about planets in terms of the five classical planets. All right, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. 
let's just not, not think about Uranus and Neptune right now. For thousands of years, those were the five planets because those were the five bright, naked eye, visible planets. Uranus and Neptune were discovered much later. Of course, it was a couple hundred years ago now, but for, uh, for much of antiquity, for, for many centuries and really many millennia, um, those were the, the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now, <clears throat> um, for the purposes of our discussion tonight, um, Mercury and Venus can actually be classified differently from Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Mercury and Venus are the inferior planets. And the reason is because you only see them either at sunset or sunrise because they basically uh, are only visible close to the sun. They, they, you can think of them as, as two little dogs kind of hugging their master, if you will. So you're not gonna see Mercury or Venus at midnight. That's why we call them inferior planets. Now, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are superior planets because you could actually see them at midnight all throughout the course of the night. And when they reach opposition, like Mars did a year ago, uh, that, that's actually an ideal time to, to view one of the superior planets. But we'll save that discussion for a later time. So May of 2021 has been Mercury month. May is Mercury month. And if you've been in this hobby for decades like I have, it really has been an exciting time because it's so elusive to see the planet Mercury. Um, I saw it a few times this month. I actually got my eight inch out early in the month, saw it in the early evening sky as, as the sun was setting, saw it last week at Shelby Farms when we had an observing session there. And it was just quite a thrill to see Mercury. Uh, you, you know you're an astronomy nerd when you, nerd, when you get really excited about seeing Mercury naked eye in, in the night sky. And um, this was really, I, I can't recall a time for me personally when I had a better view of the planet Mercury. But the inferior planets, like I said, Mercury and Venus, we know the answer today because they're closer to the sun than the Earth is. But for thousands of years, it wasn't exactly sure we, that what was going on. Uh, it was thought that the Earth was fixed and unmoving at the center of the universe and everything else went around the Earth. So to try and describe Mercury and Venus in terms of their position in the sky, they were called the inferior planets. Now, if you look at a diagram here, Today, again, the sun at the center of the solar system, Earth here, these are the four positions of the inferior planets. When the planet is on the opposite side of the sun, it's, in call, it's what's called superior conjunction. We don't see Mercury or Venus when it's in that phase. Same thing with inferior conjunction because it's in between the Earth and the sun. That would be analogous to a new moon phase. The best time to see one of the inferior planets is when it reaches elongation. And in the case of Mercury, it reached what's called maximum Eastern elongation earlier this month, specifically May 17. And that is when it's at its maximum angle in the sky from uh, where the sun is. So if you're here on earth as the sun is setting and you'll see the sun set in the Western sky if you drew an angle from the setting sun, uh, maximum Eastern elongation would be when the planet is the highest in the sky. In the case of Mercury, 28 degrees, Venus, 47 degrees. Now, Venus is much easier to see because it's brighter and typically the angle is higher. Mercury, much more elusive. But if you drew a diagram, again, here where the sun is setting in the evening sky, it would be at its maximum angle. In the case of Mercury, 28 degrees. That's what happened on May 17. And essentially what's happening now is Mercury is sinking closer and closer to the sun and pretty soon it won't be visible anymore. And the reason is because it is again reaching inferior conjunction. So that is what's happening in terms of the actual phases. So what we've got coming up a week from, but basically next Friday, the 28th of May is a conjunction of Mercury and Venus. So they will be, very close to each other, less than half a degree apart in the sky. So if you have a telescope and possibly even binoculars, and you, you will be able to see both of these in the same field of view. And it'll look like this. Uh, Billy showed you the phases that Venus is going through. As it sinks closer to the sun, it's becoming more and more of a thin crescent. So that's what you will see if you're able to see it in a telescope, a very thin crescent of Mercury. 
Venus is um, waxing, essentially. It'll be pretty close to a full disk next week. What's interesting is from our vantage point on Earth, the disks of these two planets will be about the same size, even though Mercury is much smaller than Venus. It just happens to be that the position of these planets means that um, their apparent size is going to be about the same. But um, you'll see something like this. I'm looking for, if it's clear next week, I will, I will certainly be out to see if I can view this. Um, it may be very hard to see Mercury because Venus will be about 300 times brighter. And again, close to a full disk where Mercury is a thin crescent. My weapon of choice is this telescope right here. It's my three and a half inch ETX. I use this primarily for the moon, the sun and some of the planetary stuff. And you can also kind of see where it would be in the sky. Essentially, you're looking straight west at sunset, maybe a little north of west. And uh, if you identify these two stars up here, it's Pollux and Castor and Gemini, you'll see a very faint Mars that is, um, again, getting further and further away from us. So you'll still be able to see it. But Mercury and Venus, Venus will be clearly visible on the horizon. If you have binoculars or a small scope, uh, this will be a great sight to see. So Again, May 28, next Friday, a conjunction of Mercury and Venus. But even if you don't see that, it's been a very exciting month, May 2021, for viewing Mercury. So that pretty much concludes the discussion. I'll turn it back over to Billy. All righty. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment, uh, but that may be changing here shortly. So we'll be sure to keep track of any of those questions. And if we have time in between segments or at the end of the program, we'll readdress those. But great uh, discussion on, on, on what's meant by, you know, greatest elongation and things like that. Because that's often sometimes the things we hear, but we don't really know exactly what it means. So thank you for putting that into a perspective for us. All righty. Um, now we are going to head over to East Tennessee, in fact, just about as far east in Tennessee as you can get, and we're going to join Adam Thans, uh, who is uh, with the Bays Mountain Park and Planetarium. Um, and if I've got my notes correct here, he's been there since 1992, educating everyone about the skies and, and teaching everyone about astronomy. And so tonight, hopefully he still has a, a good view of, I think, what probably everyone's favorite object, and that'd be the moon. So Adam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Billy. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody for having me um, be a part of this uh, program. And um, what I'm gonna be doing here um, is looking at the moon. I've got some hazy skies. So let's start by at least seeing something. Um, so. You can see the moon, you can see some craters. You also see some dark and light areas on the moon itself. Um, the, of course, you know, what we're looking through is thin clouds and they're just kind of making everything fuzzy. Um, hopefully it'll be a little nicer later on, but I, I don't know. Um, but don't worry, I have a photograph that I can show you of the moon that's almost the exact same phase. So first of all, you know, we've been talking about the phases of objects, the phase of Venus and also of Mercury. And it's essentially just the fact that these are all spherical objects. They're balls in space and how the sun's light shines on them and the angle of that object in relation to the earth and also our view of the sun at a different angle. So if an object like Jeremy mentioned about Jupiter and Saturn, we could see them at midnight means that they'd be opposite the sun. That means we would see them as a full disc. But um, at other times, if you actually look at say Jupiter or Saturn and they're say at a 45 degree angle away from the sun, uh, we're actually going to see kind of a gibbous phase like this. Now, this is also true with the moon and also with Mercury and Venus. In fact, we theoretically cannot see a full Venus or a full Mercury because it would have to be on the other side of the sun. And obviously we can't see that. But with the moon, it goes around the earth. And so it can be opposite the uh, 
sun in the sky. And guess what? That's happening next week. I'll be talking about that in just a moment. So let's talk about the moon. So you can see the phase. This is a waxing gibbous phase. That means that it looks like it's getting larger. More of the surface is being visible or being shined on because the moon's going around the earth and it's getting um, more opposite the sun. So we're going from a crescent phase to half, which really we should call first quarter, to a gibbous, and then to full moon, where it'd be almost opposite the sun. Um, and so that's waxing. If you continue on to the other two weeks, uh, the next two weeks of the moon cycle, then it's waning. And when it goes back to a new moon, when it's kind of in the same direction as the sun, and of course, we can't see it, partly because of the glare of the sun. The other is the daylight side of the moon is on the other side of the moon. Get it? Because the moon is in be kind of in between us and the sun. So we're looking at the nighttime side of the moon during new, new moon. So we have a gibbous phase. It's more than a quarter, less than full. So we see that gibbous phase. We see the craters, the maria, the dark areas, which are actually lava plains. And I talked about those uh, a month ago when we did our last um, virtual meeting uh, for Tennessee and the world. But I do have a nice photo. So obviously this is a nice cleaner photo. This is with no atmospheric haze at all. And uh, you can see the craters, those small areas, which are actually impact sites and the Maria, which are actually large impact sites. So much so that they cracked the surface and lava from below upwelled and filled in the low lying areas, which is why they're all circular. I also have this, pic this uh, annotated image that I made earlier today to show you some of the major craters that are visible now at this phase, uh, that they're highlighted mostly, two of which, Tycho and Copernicus. Now, all of the craters on the moon are named after famous scientists. Um, and Tycho, um, if, if you're Danish, you, you'll call him Tycho. And that crater there at the bottom, notice What's happening? Can you see the ray structure emanating from Tycho? Well, that's because of the impact from billions of years ago when, it, when an asteroid hit the moon, it exploded on the surface and ejected material out, essentially into space and eventually falling back onto the surface. And so, um, I'm not sure if you'll see my mouse, but from Tycho, you'll see ray structure going way off, far away. The rays of Tycho travel almost a thousand miles. So imagine that ejecta shooting off and eventually, eventually landing back on the surface of the moon. And where it hit was in the highlands area. So there's a lot of, um, the rocky material is very white bright colored material, uh, a lot of silicates, of course. And, um, and that's why it's so easy to see that ray structure. A good analogy, even an experiment you could do at home, uh, even on a small scale, is if you had a little pan of flour and you threw a rock in it and you get that, you know, that, that material just shooting off and then landing and you would see kind of that ray structure and of course, kind of a crater. It's not, an Im it's not an explosion impact site. It's just the rock going smack into the flower, but still. Tycho, by the way, to give you scale, is 53 miles wide. Now I had mentioned, I labeled two other craters, but I'm gonna actually skip those. And you can get online and find moon maps uh, that la label everything. And so that can be a fun thing to do. And you, the view you see right here is what you would see in binoculars. OK, you'd be able to see these major features in binoculars easy. Copernicus up here uh, landed in a Maria area, which is a basalt lava material. It's solidified, of course. But you notice there's not, there's not as much of the ray structure because it didn't have as much of that uh, 
brighter material to then eject out. It does have some ray structure. It's slightly larger, 58 miles wide. It's also 2.3 miles deep. Think about that. And so, you know, a hole in the ground, 2.3 miles deep. So some really neat features to look for on the moon. Let me go back. It's a little better. Uh, let me adjust the exposure. Just a touch. There we go. So this is a live view. It's still hazy, but you can see, and it's still soft, but you can see Tycho down like in the bottom center. And then off to the upper left, you're gonna see Copernicus. So do try to look for that. There's something coming up next week and I alluded to it. And okay, well, you know, what is this picture? It's a lunar eclipse. Uh, what happens is, is that the moon can travel in the shadow of the earth. And um, this is a map from NASA. And if you can see on the upper left where the United States is and where Tennessee is, we're in between where it says U1 and U2, okay? And the next pictures will explain more. So what's happening, if you can see the picture in the upper right now, there's P1, then U1, then a U2, and then it goes uh, U4 and P4. The P means penumbral, the U means umbral. And for any shadow from an object that has an actual size to it, like the sun, it is not a pinpoint, it is a giant sphere, a giant ball in space, emanating light, but the fact that it has width and that it's shining onto the earth and the earth's shadow, that means that there is a, um, there are these uh, shadows that are, there's one that's very conical and another that's kind of an opposite of a cone. And that's why you actually have two shadows. The penumbral shadow is the lighter shadow. It's not as dark. The umbral shadow, which is the central circle, the blue, this light blue area, is the darker shadow of the Earth. So when the moon goes into the shadow of the Earth, a number of things happen. One is you don't see a totally, you don't see the moon just disappear. It's going through variations, shades of shadow. And because we, the Earth has an atmosphere, it's also scattering light. And so the moon will actually look reddish as it starts going into the umbral shadow. What makes this particular eclipse a little hard, so you have to be honest about this. One, okay, it's on May 26. Notice the time, 4.47 a.m. That is before sunrise, okay? Really early. So if you are up really early, go for it. Try to view it. Um, 4.47 is when it just touches the penumbral shadow. You will not see any difference with the moon. The moon is a full moon. It's gonna be bright. If it's clear, it's gonna be white and very bright. Okay, next picture is U1. When the moon is actually just touching the edge of the umbral shadow, and that means that it's gonna start, that's when it just starts getting um, some darkness. Uh, I'm not talking about like really dark, but that it's not gonna be fully, fully bright, slightly dim, and you'll just start seeing some reddishness. Notice the picture. Notice how low the moon is. I'm actually, um, so, okay. So we're looking to the Southwest. It's 544 in the morning and you notice the sky is getting light, okay? this is going to be a challenge. One, do you even have a low horizon that you can see this? Um, you need as a low horizon as possible. So really you're not gonna see much of a difference between P1 and U1 for that hour, but at U1 is when it starts. The next image, I had a cheat on this picture and you'll see why, because the moon was behind the trees at the edge of the ground and so at 613 is moonset. 
and it's in the umbral shadow. If you were able, now East Tennessee, good luck in trying to find a low horizon anywhere. Middle West Tennessee, you have a very good chance of seeing a very low true horizon, especially if you could get on a hill or a building and looking out and down, you have a chance and use binoculars. And moonset 613, but you'll start noticing the reddish uh, hue with that. Now, any of our viewers are west of us, the west coast of the United States. Let's go back to that map. Notice where, say, California is. They're uh, on the edge of U4 going to P4. So anybody in the west side of the United States is actually going to have a better chance of seeing the lunar eclipse. The ones that have the best view, Hawaii, Tahiti, you know, those islands. And then uh, over here on the right side, you'll see the um, eastern side of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so they're the ones that are going to see the entire lunar eclipse. Can't control it, but that's how it goes. Um, let me go back to the moon. Let's see how the moon is. Okay. It's still a little fuzzy. It's actually got a little pinkishness. Um, that's for the atmosphere. That has nothing to do with anything. Uh, but uh, I think I'm going to actually, I think I've done my 15 minutes. So look for Tycho, the bottom center there, that crater of the moon, and Copernicus on the kind of mid le upper left area. And um, let me see if there's any questions. All right, thank you, Adam. Yes, we actually do have a question. Um, have there been any human witnessed meteor strikes on the moon? Excellent question. Has anybody seen something actually hit the moon in our modern day? The answer is yes. Um, I don't, okay, there is, there is a story of, I believe, a Jesuit priest who actually saw a very large impact like hundreds of years ago. I honestly could not remember the date. But in our modern day, yes, um, there have been times when people have had video cameras on the moon. So like what I just did with my camera. It is a digital camera. It's, it is kind of a video feature. But if I was recording it, uh, just like some of these other people have, and they have captured a little flash of light from a, an impact. Now, these were not gigantic impacts. These were small impacts. Um, but um, still, I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing to actually see. And I think one of them was during a lunar eclipse, if I remember actually, correctly. Adam, I've when I saw the question pop up, I went ahead and found the image. So if you want to oh, okay. talk, and I'll do a share screen. That's good, because you have better internet than me. Go do it. There we go. There you go. Lunar eclipse, you see the red color. And you see where he's pointing. Let me zoom in on that area right there. So you it's hard to see, but there's, right? there's a little rectangle right there. And they're showing the inset of it over here. So you right. can see, you that, see that little flash spot. of white. And it was just like me, one frame or something. Let me zoom in a bit more here. Oh, okay. There we go. Now we can see it. Yes. So imagine if that happened just on the other side of the moon, not the, the far side, but the right side where it's really bright. We would never have seen it. The fact that it happened at the part of the moon that was in the darker part of the shadow allowed us to be able to see that impact, which is pretty cool. We've also seen a comet hit Jupiter. That was Shoemaker Levy 9. Uh, that was spectacular. Um, those of us who are old enough to remember that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that was pretty cool. I was able to, I, you know, when it came around, when Jupiter rotated around and it was like not the greatest weather, but I was able to actually see it in the telescope. That was exciting. All right, well, thank you very much, Adam. Um, sure. Oh, there was one thing I was going to mention um, that um, 
in the astronomy picture of the day we were just looking at, which I would highly recommend everybody check out the astronomy picture of the day. Uh, it's apod.nasa.gov. Uh, you can search for it on Google. But um, one thing that was in the text of the caption for that was that there is a, um, it's called the Moon Impact Detection and Analysis System or MIDAS. Um, that is actually, I think it's multiple telescopes that track the moon and they've got video cameras, high speed video cameras, and they're constantly looking for impacts. And they've caught quite a few. And a lot of these are, are small enough and faint enough that um, they would, the flash would have been too brief for the human eye to see. But you know, if they're large enough, then they make a big enough flash that uh, the eye would be able to see a, a little bit better. And I think based on the analysis of how bright the impact of that, uh, that uh, one collision was in the, the lunar eclipse image we saw, I think it was calculated that if you happen to be looking at the moon at just that time, and you know your eyes were good and adapted to the dark that you might have been able to see that but don't quote me on that all right uh let me see do we have any other questions before we move on to our, our next presenter uh let's see i don't believe so so thank you so much adam all sure. right and thank now you. we're going to go back uh back over to the opposite side of the state uh and visit with dr ann viano uh, she's with uh, Rhodes College and also is a member of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Uh, she has uh, been with Rhodes College for 22 years and teaches all uh, different types of physics curriculum at all levels and also manages the, uh, the college's observatory, which I think she's in tonight. Uh, but tonight she's going to be telling us a little bit about some interesting bundles of objects in the sky. So I won't I won't steal any thunder. So Anne, go ahead and take it away, please. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying everything you're seeing so far. Uh, I am going to share my screen here, and hopefully you can see what looks like a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I'm hoping. Um, so uh, this is the physics building at Rhodes College, and I am currently in this uh, observatory, which is up on the fifth floor. To the right, uh, which is south, we have an observing deck, and we are also right on the flight path for Memphis International. And so when the wind is either north or south, the planes come right over, right overhead. So I'll try to pause if there's a really loud one. Um, so what I wanted to talk about tonight is uh, things that are far away from us. We've been focusing on planets and the moon, which is wonderful. But I wanted to talk about stars, some of which are very far away. And, and the particular type of stellar objects I'm going to talk about are very far away. But I first wanted to talk a little bit about how stars form. You may not have really thought about how stars actually become stars. If we look out in the universe um, or in the galaxy or certain parts of the galaxy, we find these large clouds of stuff and, and stars are made of all kinds of different gases, but mostly hydrogen gas, which was formed in the Big Bang, a little bit of helium, but traces of all the different elements on the periodic table. So in this image on the slide, uh, this is an image of a star forming region in a neighboring galaxy to the Milky Way, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is just a large cloud of material that can form stars. The distance to this particular uh, star forming region is 160,000 light years. And one light year, which is actually a distance, even though it sounds like a time, it's actually a distance, is about 5.8 trillion miles. So it's a really, big number of miles, which is why astronomers like to call it one of something. So light year, it's the distance light would travel in a year, but you might just keep in mind tonight that it's about six trillion miles. So stars will form in these clouds and all it takes is some kind of disturbance in the cloud. And fortunately, the universe is full of disturbances and usually it's triggered by a shock wave. So a star exploding like a supernova can provide a shock wave that will then start this process of star formation, which really just means that gravity starts collapsing parts of this cloud and that collapse eventually leads to a star. 
Now, I'm not going to get into the details of star formation, but as this process happens, you will get all different kinds of stars. And we tend to classify stars by their mass, so how much stuff. Um, in a cloud like this, if a shock wave passes through, it will start the formation of high mass stars, which are stars that have masses bigger than about 15 times the mass of the sun. Intermediate mass stars, maybe one to 15 times the mass of the sun. And then we talk about small mass stars, which are less than one times the mass of the sun. So even if you look closely in this cloud, you can see some little, like little chunks. Hopefully you can see my pointer, little chunks that are kind of broken off. Here's a larger one, but these little chunks are on their way to becoming stars. As gravity collapses, these chunks of the cloud, they begin to radiate a little bit, give off some infrared radiation, and that kind of pushes the rest of the cloud away and they become, uh, eventually become stars. So remember that all different types of stars will form. Um, and if we think of just a section of one of these big molecular clouds, um, a group of stars that form from the same parent cloud, they're all gonna form roughly at the same time. In astronomy terms, that could be anywhere from two days apart to two 20,000 years apart, but at roughly the same time in astronomy terms. So here I have um, a, a cloud and these black dots are just to represent the cloud of hydrogen gas. And, and remember there's other trace elements as well. And it turns out that the type of stars that form the fastest are large mass stars. And these are the very luminous stars that they burn very hot. They give off a lot of energy, which can make them very bright in the sky. And if you know about types of stars, these are the O type and the B type of stars. They're blue and, and blue and white. They're very energetic. So they're very easy to see. And so at the beginning in our little cloud, we, can, we only will see these blue and white stars, the biggest, most energetic stars, because they're the ones that form the fastest. And why do they form the fastest? It's because gravity is stronger when you have more mass. So if you get more mass coming together, gravity is much stronger, it will come together faster. Now, as time goes by, so we take a snapshot, leap ahead an eon or two, then we'll get other types of stars to form, lower mass stars. They take longer to form because they have less mass, so gravity squeezes them more gently. They stu still do become stars, it just takes longer. And so these other stars here, I've just colored some yellow and orange and red. Um, these are the other spectral types. They might take on the order of tens of millions of years to form. Whereas these very energetic stars, the blue and white hot stars, less than 10,000 years to form. So in our giant cloud of stuff that is forming stars, we first see the brightest stars, these blue and whitish stars, and then we start to see the formation of all the other spectral types. Now these lower mass stars, these yellow and reddish ones, burn at lower temperatures, and therefore they're not nearly as energetic. So when we look at a cloud, the, the very energetic stars, the blue and white, really energetic stars, they just pop out. And sometimes it's hard to realize that there's probably some of these smaller mass stars in there as well. So let's take a look here. Um, how could you find some star clusters? So a star cluster is just a, a part of a, a cloud of stuff that where stars are all forming at roughly the same time. And there are some that are really easy to find. If you know the constellation Orion here, you can see the, the bow and the, I don't remember what he had. This is the bow and this is the shield, I think. But here's the belt of Orion down here. And the constellation next door is Taurus, the bull. And the part that forms the eyes and the horns of Taurus, or maybe even the face, is a star cluster. This is called the Hyades. There's another star cluster in the back of Taurus, the bull, and that's called the Pleiades. You might be familiar with that. If we zoom in on the Hyades cluster, um, ignore this yellowish star. That's a star that's much closer to us. That's Aldebaran. Um, it's not part of the star cluster, but you may notice that the stars in the cluster appear to be what color? Ah, 
they appear to be blue. Those blue, really luminous, energetic stars, they're the first ones to form. So by knowing that, we know that this is a relatively young star cluster. And in fact, this one is only about 680 million years old. And in astronomy terms, that's a young star cluster. Wouldn't that be nice if that were true for humans, right? So when these star clusters are young and full of these very bright blue hot stars, we call them open star clusters because the stars are relatively spread out in space. Uh, on the left here, this is a star forming region in the nebula NGC 602. Astronomers are not creative, um, but this is in the small Magellanic cloud, which is a neighboring galaxy to the Milky Way. Uh, this cloud of material is about 200,000 light years away. And the age of this relatively young cluster is 5 million years. And again, we see all these bright blue, very hot, luminous stars. They have just formed, they're the first ones to form, but there are also maybe you know, dimmer other types of stars, other spectral types of stars. On the right here, this is the one uh, we talked about on the previous slide. This is everyone's favorite, the Pleiades. Uh, and this is in Taurus. This one is in our galaxy, the Milky Way. It's only about 400 light years away, so relatively close. Uh, there are about 800 stars in this young star cluster, this open star cluster. And it's about 100 million years old, this entire cluster. Uh, you might be wondering why it has this bluish cast. Um, both of these clusters are, are young clusters. So there's still a lot of dust and gas available to make more stars. And when these bright blue stars start to shine, that dust tends to scatter, or the, the light tends to scatter off the dust and gives us a blue cast sometimes. This is the same reason that our sky is blue because light is scattering off of the dust in the atmosphere, the, the particles in the atmosphere. So a lot of these young star clusters will have a bluish cast. Okay, so let's let our star cluster age a little bit. So here we were, we had a nice star cluster, the, the bright, hot, blue, whitish stars formed first. And then we got some other spectral types, yellow ones like our sun and different spectral types. Remember that just means a different mass star. Now it turns out that the hot luminous stars, they, they live fast and die young, right? They, they burn really hot, which means they go through their fuel uh, their nuclear fuel to be a star very quickly, and they, they don't live very long. So they die out at relatively short time scales. Um, three to maybe 30 million years is how long one of these very bright stars will live. The cooler stars that took longer to form also burn more slowly. So they're kind of slow and steady in their lives, and they live for a pretty long time compared to these hot luminous stars maybe 10 billion to even a trillion years for the lowest mass stars. Um, Proxima Centauri is one of these very long lived stars. It's a very low mass star. So as the star cluster ages, what happens is that the bright blue stars and white stars, they die, but what's left are the low mass stars. The, the less luminous, not as bright, sort of different spectral color stars are the only ones that are left. So the composition of our star cluster changes. We lose the nice luminous pretty stars. We also lose a lot of the dust and gas. As more of these stars form, we're using up the dust and gas in the cloud. So we just end up with a lot of stars, but not so many big bright luminous stars anymore. So here are some more pictures of stars, star clusters, because I think they're so beautiful. Um, this is a cluster in the Tarantula Nebula, uh, again, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a neighboring galaxy to the Milky Way. This particular star cluster is about 160,000 light years away. And remember, a light year was about 6 trillion miles. Oh, uh, there are maybe 100 stars, looks like more than 100 stars. Uh, where do you stop counting, right? And um, what's unusual about this particular cluster is that these stars are all really massive stars, 100 times the mass of the sun. And you can tell by how incredibly blue and, and luminous they are. They're so bright, they're burning very hot, they look, have this blue cast, 
because they're high mass stars undergoing these nuclear reactions. Uh, this again is a relatively young cluster, one and a half million years. Let's let time advance now. Here's another cluster. And this one's a little bit older. This is 13.4 billion years old. So time has advanced. And you might notice in this picture, there are a lot less of those bright blue stars. And now you can start to see that there are a lot of other types of stars. Yellow cast stars like our sun, lower mass stars that would look more red, and everything in between. And you may notice that there's a lack of dust in this star cluster. So this cluster is on the older side. You might also notice that there's no, I just said there's no dust or gas. So this is a much older cluster. And this one is in fact pretty old, 13.4 billion years old. And as time has advanced, more and more of these stars have formed. Um, a lot of them will die out if they're blue type stars. So they have a lot more stars than these early clusters or young clusters. So this is about 400,000 different stars. And you may notice that it's kind of globby in the center. It seems like it's really dense with stars in the center. And then the density kind of falls off. Um, this cloud was very dense in the center. So that's where most of the stars form, but it kind of looks like a glob. So astronomers call these globular clusters. That's where this name comes from. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is NGC 121, which is in the constellation, the Toucan. I love birds, so I thought this was appropriate. And again, this is in a neighboring galaxy to the Milky Way. Um, it's visible in the Southern Hemisphere, the small Magellanic Cloud. This one's about 200,000 light years away from us. And if you're wondering how big these are in the sky, the diameter of this cluster is about 350 light years from one, one edge to the other. It's hard to really say where do you, what do you call the edge, but hundreds of light years across. So these are fairly large objects in the sky, not as large as a galaxy, but um, they're large and fun to look at. This particular cluster is estimated to be about 10 billion years old. You might be wondering, well, how do you tell the age of the star cluster? You basically look at what types of stars are left. If there are only sun type stars and longer lived stars, then we know that cluster is about as old as the sun, which is 10 billion, uh, right now it's 5 billion years old. It will live 10 billion years. If there are lots of O type stars, we know that they don't live very long. So the cluster must be very young to have those kinds of stars. So you can actually map these stars on a, a, a chart astronomers call the HR diagram, and you can figure out how old the star cluster is. Now, where do these clusters hang out? Are they everywhere in, in a galaxy? Are they in between galaxies? Are they right next to the sun? Are we, gonna, are we part of one of these clusters? Uh, unfortunately, no, we're not, or maybe good, we're not part of a star cluster. Um, where you find these globular clusters is kind of an un unusual place. It turns out that spiral galaxies like our Milky Way, um, this, this is like the Milky Way, but this is actually M104, the Sombrero galaxy, but it's a spiral galaxy much like our Milky Way. And we're looking edge on on the galaxy. So it's like a Frisbee and we're looking at the edge and this is the center of the Frisbee. These spiral galaxies are surrounded by kind of like a, a bubble called the halo, the galactic halo. And it's in the galactic halo that you find these globular clusters. You don't find them in the disk where you have the beautiful spiral arms, where the sun is located in our Milky Way galaxy. Globular clusters are found way far away from the disk. They're out in the galactic halo. And this leads a lot of astronomers to maybe start to think about, well, how did the galaxy form? If you only find globular clusters out here in the halo, and we know that those are really old, was the galaxy once really big and then it flattened and then all that's left out here is, is globular clusters. Uh, there are lots of theories about galaxy formation and we'll leave that for another session. It's just, it leads to some really interesting um, discussion. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because my colleague and friend John is going to talk to you about observing a particular star cluster. And um, 
if, if he doesn't get a picture tonight, I, I have one I can show you the next time I come back around. So if there are any questions, this would be a good time. I encourage you to go out and look at some star clusters, a pair of binoculars, looking at the Pleiades is, is a really beautiful sight. You can see the dust and gas and those bright blue stars, and it's pretty easy to find. All right, well, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, we do have a few questions. So um, one, the first one's kind of a two-parter. Um, have we found stars that are, um, that are um, or sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, at the current time, how many high mass stars have we found? And how many stars have we found that are brighter than the sun? Um, we have found many, many, many stars brighter than the sun. The, the sun is a very average star. So roughly you could say that half of the stars in the universe are brighter than the sun. And then the first question was how many high mass stars? Um, billions, yes. billions. There are just so many we can't count. The Milky Way galaxy, which is one of hundreds of thousands of maybe a million galaxies, the Milky Way galaxy itself has hundreds of thousands of stars. So it's impossible for us to count. Uh, isn't, isn't the saying that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches on the planet Earth? It, it is. In fact, uh, just to, to verify, I have gone through the math on it and, and, and came to the same conclusion. So that's what I do on my Saturday night. So what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question. There's just so many out there. Um, and a lot of stars are, there are stars of all different masses. So there are many stars that are more massive than the sun. Yeah, and I was going to also add to that, most of the stars that when you go out at night, you look up in the sky, most of the stars that you're seeing are with just your eyes, not with the telescope, but just your eyes are the ones that are going to be higher mass than the sun. And that also means that they're going to be brighter than the sun. Um, you showed the Pleiades and um, I would estimate that a lot of those blue stars, well, wouldn't estimate, but I would say that a lot of those blue stars are going to be much brighter than the sun. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Those are all O and B type stars. And our sun is a G type star, just an average middle of the road brightness. Uh, whereas those O type stars are beautiful and very, very bright. Um, actually, speaking of the Pleiades, um, there were three stars that kind of formed a triangle in the Pleiades near the middle. Um, let's see here. And also has a brighter star near them. Or do you know what those stars are? Are they just members of that cluster that just happen to form a triangle or? or... Um, they are members of the cluster. You, you could probably Google up a picture of the Pleiades that has the names of those stars. Uh, I had one, but they're so hard to pronounce. I knew that if I tried, I would mess it up horribly. So I didn't put it in there, but um, the names of the stars in the Pleiades are beautiful. They're Arabic mm -hmm. names, but um, I just didn't put it in there today. Sorry. No, 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 that's good. Uh, one more question. Uh, actually, it's a two-parter. Are most clusters in nebulae um, or are, let's see here, or maybe the nebulae dust in clusters like the beehive has maybe been used up? Yes, so as a star cluster ages, that dust makes stars and eventually you get to the point where there's no dust left. It's all been used up to make stars. And that's when you transition from sort of an open cluster with lots of beautiful nebulosity to a globular cluster where you just have stars, all the dust is gone. And that's kind of the interesting thing about star clusters being in the halo of the galaxy. There's no dust and gas left out there to make new stars it's all in the disk of the galaxy. So how did that happen? <laughs> That's the question gotcha. astronomers try to answer. And, and I would also just add that in like the Orion Nebula where we have stars being formed right now, when if we get these really big stars forming, they put out so much light and they give off so much what's known as solar wind that it can actually push away a lot of that gas and dust to where it can't be used for star formation. So when the big guys kind of turn on, it can, it can kind of be a bad news for some of the smaller stars that are trying to form because they can blow away the material that those smaller stars or future stars might form from. 
All righty. Um, let's see. Well, again, thank you so much, Anne. That was really interesting. And I look forward to hearing the second part of that when we actually get to look at uh, some more of these clusters. Uh, but now we're going to turn it over. Uh, we're going to come back to Middle Tennessee. Uh, we're going to go a little bit south of Nashville, and we're going to join John Kramer, who is a member of the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. Um, he's an avid stargazer who loves showing uh, the views of the night sky live, especially during these virtual times. Uh, by uh, broadcasting to networks uh, like the nightskiesnetwork.com. And he also has a YouTube channel called At The Eyepiece. So be sure to check that out. Uh, so John, what are we gonna be looking at tonight? All right, thank you. Yes, uh, so tonight I do have clouds, but I do have some very recent images. We are going to be talking about just how Ann gave us the intro to these types of objects, we are gonna be looking at a globular cluster. And actually we have a two for one actually tonight. We are gonna be talking about and showing you Messier 3 and a really cool star within uh, Messier 3 called Bernard's Variable Star. So let's go ahead and start talking and, and seeing a little bit more about this particular object. I usually like to start off with some quick quick facts on the objects that we will be looking at tonight. Now, um, Messier 3 is actually one of the largest and brightest globular clusters in the night sky at magnitude 6. So it's just below your ability to pick it out visually if you were in a very pristine night sky and able to go ahead and uh, have pristine type of skies as well as very clear and of course excellent eyesight. Another cool factor about this globular cluster is it's estimated to have approximately 500,000 members in it. So that is just incredible. It's also very old as, as Anne kind of hinted with these stars are, are are kind of a reddish hue, low mass. So they are going to be pretty old. And that is at about 11.4 billion years old for this particular globular cluster. Now, keep in mind, they estimate our universe to be, what, 13.7 billion years old. So you can see, at least in the time scale of the universe we're talking about, that's really back there. Now, tonight, we're going to be talking about one particular type of star in there. Uh, called a variable star. There's actually 274 other variable stars in Messier 3. So that is by far um, the largest number of variable stars in one particular globular cluster. So I thought that was really cool as well. Now, astronomers love to catalog things. So this particular variable, you might see it listed here as V154 in M3 or Messier 3. And interestingly enough, it was the first pulsating uh, variable star ever to be discovered in a globular. So let's talk about why it's named Bernard's variable star and give you a little bit information on that. So who is this Bernard fellow? Well, we got a local here because he's from Tennessee, Edward Emerson Bernard. He's also known uh, in publications, you might see E.E. E. Bernard. He was born right up the road there in Nashville, Tennessee. And he became famous as an observational uh, astronomer um, after working at a photography studio and actually discovering 10 comets on his own. And it, one of the interesting facts is one of those comets were the first ever to be discovered photographically. And here's another really, really cool factor. He was an amateur. He was an amateur astronomer. He lived in the Nashville area. He observed with his own made equipment and he was uh, impressed enough of the amateur astronomers around Nashville that they actually raised money to give him a fellowship at Vanderbilt University right up the road where he received an honorary degree. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it's still the first honorary degree ever bestowed from Vanderbilt University. So another cool little fact there. He made a number of other um, uh, discoveries, um, not only when he worked at, at Vander, uh, Vanderbilt, but also in, in different professional observatories around the country. Uh, he, Bernard Starr is probably his most famous uh, discovery. 
but he's also gone ahead and, and made uh, his namesake is on uh, Bernard's Loop and uh, Bernard's Galaxy, plus a number of the comets that I mentioned. And I'm a member of the club right up there in Nashville and, well, Bernard Seaford Astronomical Society, yep, named after Edward Bernard. So that's a couple of cool facts about uh, Edward himself and how he contributed to part of tonight's topic here, where we're talking about Messier 3 and Bernard's variable star. Now, I mentioned, unfortunately, we are usually going and doing this live, but we got clouds. So if we weren't, I thought it would be interesting to at least tell you a little bit about some of the amateur level equipment that I use. It's a, a telescope, it's a Celestron 8. It's an 8-inch aperture telescope. It's not huge by any factor. Uh, I do use a computerized mount. Uh, it permits you to go to objects and track them, of course, through the night sky. We do use a color camera. Interestingly enough, it's a CMOS camera. And it is a color camera. We use that because after all, color is pretty cool. Although a lot of astronomy out there is done by monochrome cameras for the scientific aspect of it. And our software, we generally share live on, uh, on screen right there with the views is called SharpCap Pro. And uh, you can go ahead and check those out uh, for yourself. Now, uh, enough talk, so let's, let's take a look at this object. Well, as I mentioned, unfortunately, I am not able to go ahead and share it live, but what we will do is let's go ahead and show you a picture that's pretty recent uh, for the object that I took with the same equipment that was previously mentioned. And this was taken on May 13th, so yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. This is the beautiful globular cluster uh, M3. This represents a live screen capture, uh, basically of M3. And we generally like to take not just one snapshot, if you will, but we, what, we do what's called stacking. So this represents 11 60 second images stacked one upon the other to really improve the overall image and share it live with that software. It does, it handles all of that. There's no what's called post-processing. So by itself, this globular cluster is stunning. Uh, like previous slide mentioned, it's one of the brightest. You could go out there and spot this with a pair of binoculars. Of course, to start to resolve it, you're going to need a larger aperture telescope. Another a couple of interesting facts here. When we're talking about globular clusters, there are different classes of globular clusters. You have globular clusters that are class one that are really tightly condensed globular clusters. You can't, almost to the point where you can't resolve them at all with an optical telescope. Then you have all the way on the other side of the spectrum there, a class 12 globular cluster. Well, those are very loose, right? In fact, they can also visually, uh, I've done it, uh, be mistaken for just a tightly uh, compact or a tightly uh, bound uh, open cluster, but they are indeed globular clusters with not a whole lot of centralization towards uh, the central core. Um, Messier 3 kind of falls right in the middle there at a class 6. So you can see how you can get a lot of stars resolved around the outer edge, but you can also dive pretty deep into the center region of this particular globular cluster and have a lot of fun picking out particular uh, stars in there. And one of them is what we're going to be talking about here on our next slide. That is Bernard's variable star. So I actually caught the variability of this object. Oops, wrong way. Caught the variability of the object um, just last month. So you can see by the timestamp on the image. And again, this is from the equipment that I use in the backyard. Um, same equipment from the previous couple of slides ago. Uh, you can see, hopefully that's coming through on the broadcast, the arrow indicating a star uh, in the image on the left-hand part of the screen. That is Bernard's variable star. And you'll notice 
on the right, this highlighted star, well, what is it doing? It appears brighter, doesn't it? Well, that's what a variable star does. It actually changes in brightness. In the simplest of terms, it changes its brightness. Now, there's a lot of scientific -y things going on associated with that. So we are going to try to scratch the surface a bit with that on our next slide. But how cool is that? In just four nights, uh, this was taken on the left. Uh, what was that? Uh, April 21st. And the image on the right is just a few days later on the 25th of April, and it's discernibly brighter than the previous one. Same exposures, same equipment. So what is a variable star? Well, I mentioned, simply put, it changes in brightness, right? In particular, Bernard's variable star, or as they categorize it here, V154, is a, is a pulsating variable. The graphic on the left is kind of showcasing what a pulsating variable does. And that is basically it gets a little bit larger, increasing in brightness, and then it shrinks, decreasing in brightness. The science of that, we're going to scratch a little bit on the surface just a bit. But in a nutshell, the, there's an atmosphere in a star, and there's layers of a star. And one particular layer of this type of star is contracting slightly and heating up. In fact, it's the layer that's burning uh, hydrogen. In its core, it's, con it's burning or fusing helium. But this one layer of hydrogen starts to constrict a little bit. And as it constricts, it starts to heat up. That is preventing the energy from the core from being completely released from the star. So now we're talking about a star at its minimum, basically. But the energy is not going to give up that easy, right? It's building up. And there's always this constant battle between energy being released and pushing out and gravity wanting to pull back in. That's when a star is at equilibrium. But these stars are kind of unstable. They're pulsating in this particular regard. So the energy output from the helium core will eventually overcome and start to push back on the other layer until it's pushed out further and further. And that layer cools down. And that is what allows the release of all that bent up energy from the star. That's when it's at its brightest. So in simplest terms, that's what's going on with a variable star. Now, this variable star is really cool for another reason. It's got a short period. There are variable stars out there that can go for years by, from being at their minimum to maximum and then back down. Fortunately for us, this only takes eight days for Bernard's variable star. It goes from a minimum of about 13.5 uh, to the maximum of 12. And that's within the reach of about an eight inch aperture telescope if you were visually trying to view these. Now, another cool thing with another globular cluster out there, Messier 3 is not alone. Messier 5, which is uh, not too far actually from Messier 3, also has two notable variable stars in those that can actually be tracked with six inch telescopes. So it makes a great. Um, observing project for you to go ahead and try to do for yourself. So let's go back to our image real quick. Just again, I want to make sure that everybody notices that the uh, star on the left is not quite at its minimum, but darn close to it. And the image that I'm highlighting there with the arrows, that particular star, as you can see, is much brighter, although this isn't even at its maximum because it's only four days uh, from about its minimum period there. So very, very cool that amateurs can go out in your backyard and see these globular clusters in and of themselves. But then we get this benefit, this cool, neat factor of these variable stars. So if you want to know more, what got me on this little observing project was the Sky and Telescope article, Hunting Bernard's Variable. So if you want to check them out for that information, you can. 
And if you want to get a lot more information that I could possibly give you on variable stars, the best place to go is AAVSO, American uh, Variable Star Observers. Amateur, I think. <laughs> I should have known that before I put that up there. But that's a great, great website as well. And so with that, I will wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. That's really cool that you were able to get Barnard Star and see how it changes its brightness over just a very short period of time. That's, that's really remarkable. Um, I'll just note in there that these types of stars, they're called Cepheids, those are really important to astronomers because that, that time it takes to vary uh, is directly related to how bright these stars actually are, not just how bright they appear, which is due to how bright they actually are in their distance, but it's actually related to their true luminosity. And so that gives us a way to figure out how bright the stars really are. We compare it to how bright they appear to be in our sky, and that gives us a distance indicator. So we can see these for thousands of light years as well. So we can find distances to nearby galaxies, to other globular clusters and things like that. So very, very cool. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, but we might get some more as, as people are learning about the globular clusters. So, um, but before we talk some more about globulars, we're going to go back over to uh, West Tennessee and we're gonna visit again with Jeremy Veldman and he's going to talk to us about a particular galaxy that you all can see right now. So Jeremy, what have you got for us? Thanks a lot, Billy. Uh, it's been a great uh, presentation so far tonight and the object I'm gonna show you is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And I think it fits in nicely with the last two talks that we have, we, we, that you've listened to uh, so far this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And spring, of course, is galaxy season, just because of um, where we are with the spring constellations. So amateur astronomers and really astronomers in general affectionately call it Spring, uh, spring galaxy season. So this is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, one of the most famous objects and one of the most famous images in all of astronomy. And it's another one that you can bag with a very modest telescope. I'll show you the one that I've used to, to view this one. And uh, again, M51, meaning it's the 51 entry into Charles Messier's catalog of non-comets. He, he wanted to become world famous around the time of George Washington for finding comets. He found a whole bunch of fuzzy patches that were called in general nebulae and cataloged them. And as a result, we have 110 what are called deep sky objects that now as amateur astronomers, backyard astronomers, if you want to learn the sky, it's, it's great to go through this catalog. So this is M51, Messier 51, otherwise known as NGC 5194, NGC standing for New General Catalog, even though it's over 100 years old. But um, you can see the, the, the constellation chart here of Ursa Major, otherwise known as the Big Dipper, and it's located right off of the handle of the Big Dipper, now this one takes a little bit of work, a little bit of skill to find. Um, in my case, more guesswork than anything. But essentially, if you draw a right angle between Mizar and Elcor and the handle of the Big Dipper and El Cade, which is at the very end of the Dipper. And by the way, these stars that make up the Dipper here are actually part of, a, of an open cluster, Dube being the exception. So Anne talked about open clusters earlier this is a cluster of stars, an open cluster of stars that makes up the Big Dipper asterism. So, but if essentially you draw a right angle or just drop down off of the handle of the Dipper, you'll come to a constellation called Canis Venetici. It's, uh, I believe, canine, uh, dog. But anyway, it's very close to the handle of the Dipper, and that's where you find the Whirlpool Galaxy in the uh, constellation Ursa Major. So, now these are gravitationally interacting galaxies. I'll show you a, an image in a minute of what that looks like and, and the significance of it. But you actually have two colliding galaxies here, NGC 5194, which is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and then NGC 5195, which is a colliding galaxy. Now combined, they're about 31 million light years away. Again, galaxies are very far away. And of course, we just said it was located in the constellation of Canis Venetici. 
Here's what we're looking at here. So in the, the bright patch here is actually the nucleus of 5195, which is colliding with um, NGC 5194. This is the Whirlpool galaxy. You can see it's a beautiful image. Um, galaxies are like snowflakes. Spiral galaxies are like snowflakes. Each one is, is, is unique. They're very different. Now, what you're looking at here is what's called, it's a spiral galaxy. We also call it a grand design spiral galaxy because the arm structures are very well defined. You can see a bright nucleus here and then a, a very well defined um, arm structure of stars and gas clouds that, that uh, emanate out from the core. And it's a face on spiral galaxy for obvious reasons. Um, edge on spirals are uh, galaxies are actually very significant. I'll explain why in a second. But you look here, you're basically looking at two distinct parts of a galaxy. You've got the bright nucleus otherwise known as the bulge or the spheroid. And then you've got a disk of stars out here, two very distinct components that make up a galaxy. Now the, uh, the, the nucleus, the, core, the, uh, the, the spheroid are composed mainly of older, what are called population two stars. These are very old stars, similar to what we see in globular clusters, metal poor, billions of years old, and um, consisting mainly of hydrogen and helium, almost no metals. Anything heavier than helium in the world of astronomy is called a metal. And that's uh, very different from what we see out in the disk here, which are younger stars. And these are more metal rich stars, not just hydrogen and helium, but also trace amounts of oxygen, carbon, silicon, lithium, anything heavier again than helium. We call those population one stars. Our sun is a population one star. It's not a generation one star. Um, it's actually uh, either a generation two or three star. Even though it's mostly hydrogen and helium, it's got heavier stuff in it. And that's why we know it's, um, you know, it's a star that you would find in the disk of a galaxy. But what you're seeing here also is a distinct density wave pattern that's so indicative of a spiral galaxy. And again, you see these arm structures here. Really what these are are waves that propagate through the disk of stars. And these waves are where you see um, more rapid star formation also, and also gas clouds. And you can think of this like a traffic jam. If you drive down the freeway and you have a lane or two that's blocked and it's blocking traffic, what you have is um, traffic jamming up. It's still flowing, but it slows down as it goes through the, the lanes where the, the traffic is condensed and then eventually it speeds up again. So if you were in a helicopter flying over a freeway you may see the lanes that are unimpeded flowing more freely. And then, um, you know, the, the, the lanes that are blocked off is where the, the traffic is backed up. Same kind of concept here in a spiral galaxy. These, these density waves are where you see, uh, gravitationally speaking, more star formation and also um, more of the gas clouds that are, that, are forming the, uh, that are the raw material for forming new stars. Now, in the case of M51, the colliding galaxy is actually a gravitational catalyst for form forming new stars. So the gravity of the, of the interacting galaxy is causing these gas clouds to condense and form new stars. So Anne talked about the shock wave from a supernova. That's one event that can cause a hydrogen gas cloud to collapse under, under uh, a shock wave to form new stars. Another event is the gravity of a colliding galaxy, and that's what we're seeing here. But um, galaxies rotate. Now, we don't discern this in a face-on spiral. I'll explain why. But we know through years of research that galaxies rotate, and they have what's called a differential rotation pattern. Okay, So solid body rotation would be analogous to a record, if, for those of you who remember the, the days of vinyl. If you have a, a solid body rotation, the outside edge of the record uh, moves, not at the same speed, it's actually moving faster than the inside part of the record, but they cover the same you know, distance at the same, same period of time. A galaxy is different, has a differential rotation. So if you can think of a star close to the nucleus of the galaxy moving at the same speed as a star further out, um, this star is actually going to rotate more quickly around the galaxy than the one out here, which is going to lag further behind, even though they're moving at um, the same speed. And I'll show you a, uh, a, a visual of that here. So you can see here, uh, again, these, these density waves 
where the that form the spiral spiral arms of the galaxy you've got stars moving in and out of the density wave pat pattern and um again the stars closer to the nucleus are, are moving more rapidly around but they're actually moving at a, a more or less a constant speed compared to the stars further out it's just that because they're closer to the nucleus they actually uh move around the nucleus of the galaxy perceived to be moving around faster than the stars further out here. Another way to think about this is in the world of track and field, if you have four sprinters that move at, that are roughly, you know, run a sprint at a roughly the same speed, if you had them all lined up, the sprinter on the outside would fall further behind than the, than the one on the inside lane if they, if they ran at essentially the same speed because he has to go a further distance. That's why they stagger sprinters in the Olympics because the ones on the outside lanes need to cover the same amount of distance in order to make up for the additional distance of being in the outside of the track, they've got to stagger them. Same kind of concept here with a density wave pattern in a spiral galaxy. Now, we do not perceive this in a face-on spiral. The reason we know this is by um, scientists analyzing edge-on galaxies and um, edge-on spirals and seeing the gas clouds and, and also stars and analyzing the spectra. And they can see the, uh, the gas clouds that are blue shifted, meaning they're moving toward us and then red shifted, meaning they're moving away from us. And from that, they can discern the, uh, the velocity. So this is years of research. And you know, again, we, will never, we would never perceive this type of rotation in a spiral galaxy. Um, but um, over time from analyzing edge on galaxies, we know that this is essentially how they, how they work. Little history lesson here. Um, as as science as as astronomers were building telescopes and noticing these fuzzy patches, in uh, in 1845, a wealthy landowner named William Parsons built the largest telescope in the world. It was the Leviathan of Parsons Town. It was a 72 inch telescope. He looked at M51 and noticed that it broke into structure. Again, prior to this, they were essentially clouds in general term, nebula. But when he looked at M51, he noticed structure. And uh, here's a sketch of the first spiral nebula, as that was called at that time in, in 1850 by Lord Ross. And this kicked off a debate about the nature of the spiral nebula. Are they gas clouds in the Milky Way that are forming other solar systems, the so-called nebular hypothesis? Or are they separate galaxies or systems of stars outside of our Milky Way, the so-called island universe hypothesis. These were two competing ideas that essentially dragged out for a couple of centuries before Edwin Hubble settled the debate in 1923 by measuring the distance to the Andromeda spiral and figuring out that it was a separate galaxy outside of the Milky Way. But it really kind of began here when uh, uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, looked at the M51, the, the, the spiral nebula, and, and uh, noticed that it had structure. So uh, this is the first sketch of M51. Let's look at it more closely here. And this is an image that, uh, that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And we can actually zoom in here. And uh, this image is on Flickr. And you see, if we zoom in here, this is, here's kind of the punchline. If you look at the arm structures here of this galaxy, you'll notice a lot of blue stars. Now, Anne talked about open clusters, these hot O and blue type stars that are really bright, really luminous and don't live very long. That's what you're essentially seeing here in the arm structure of M51. Now, again, you see some of the darker dust lanes here and the red areas are the hydrogen gas cloud. They'll call them H2 regions. That's the raw material for forming new star clusters. But you'll notice here, most of these stars are blue. So here's a star cluster, similar to the Pleiades or the Hyades open clusters, or in the summer skies, we see M6 and M7, Ptolemy's cluster, the butterfly cluster, those are open clusters of young, hot O and B type blue stars. That's the majority of the stars that you see in a galaxy. What's interesting is the majority of the stars in the universe, and either Billy or Ann can correct me on this, somebody please fact, fact check me, but we talked about the sun being an ordinary star. 
The majority of the stars in a galaxy are either red dwarf or brown dwarf stars. Very small, very faint, and you don't see those when you look at a galaxy. What you're actually seeing are the blue O and B type stars. That's what makes up the arm structure when you look at the disk in a spiral galaxy here. And uh, you're seeing all of these blue stars here. So this falls right in line with what we heard earlier in a discussion about open clusters. That is what you see when you look at the light of a galaxy. You don't, you, you, you don't see the majority of the stars in a galaxy. Those are the red dwarfs and they're so small and they're so faint that they're essentially uh, drowned out by the light of the hotter stars. And of course, here you can see, this is a, a, a pretty good analog to our Milky Way kind of a barred spiral type, very, very bright nucleus of older um, population two type stars. So pretty cool image that really shows you the structure of what makes up a spiral galaxy. So once again, my weapon of choice is a 10 inch Dobsonian. Now I use a viewfinder and a Telrad for finding objects. Uh, you just saw M3. I got stumped on this a couple of years ago and kind of found a technique for using my Telrad to get close, my viewfinder to hone in on a fuzzy patch that looks like either a galaxy or a globular. And then I, I take it from there. And here's what it looks like through a 10 inch. And again, you can see the bright nucleus of both of these galaxies. And you can start to see, if you look really closely here, kind of the arm structure here of M51. Now, most of the time, galaxies are just fuzzy patches in the eyepiece of a, of a modest telescope. But this time of year, with it being higher up in the sky, closer to the zenith, away from atmospheric uh, turbulence or light pollution on the horizon, you can get a better view of M51 and actually see some of the arm structure, which is pretty rare. But um, you, can, you can actually see it in a, in a, in a modest size telescope, like an 8-inch or a 10-inch, kind of zooming in here a little bit. And again, this is a night vision eyepiece connected to the telescope through an iPhone. That's kind of how I'm viewing it here. But this is kind of what you would see. You would see these fuzzy, you know, these, these bright fuzzy patches that are the nucleus of these two galaxies. And if you have decent, see, good seeing conditions at the right time of year, you can actually see some of the arm structure of um, M51, the Whirlpool galaxy. So that's essentially it through a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope. So again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society. We meet once a month, first Fridays. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to our website, joinmas.com. And with that, I will turn it back over to Billy. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. It's always a treat to see M51 in a telescope, though where I live, it's very, very hard to spot it, but I can usually see those, those two nuclei. So thank you for all the, the highlights and the, the tour around the galaxy. Um, but yeah, to, um, to elaborate on what you had, had mentioned before, yes, most of the stars in, in galaxies like the Milky Way or pretty much all galaxies are those low mass dim stars. And uh, at the observatory here, we actually have a, uh, an interactive model of, um, it's made out of LEDs and, and, and strands of copper wire, but it basically is a scale model of the of our little section of the galaxy and it shows the 100 nearest stars and the 100 brightest stars and, it, and it'll label them by or, or light them up by mass and things like that and so when you turn on the the little m dwarves out of the 100 stars that are the nearest stars about 85 of those are m dwarves and you can't see them with the telescope even though they're some of the closest stars to us so um, yeah, those, those big massive stars can, you know, can literally be thousands of times, tens of thousands of times brighter than M dwarf stars. So they really light up the galaxy and kind of, as you said, drown out the, the little M dwarfs. So we can't forget about our, our, our little buddies out there. Um, let's see, there was a question. Do we have, uh, or sorry, um, do all galaxies rotate counterclockwise? Yes, I believe they do. And these are the spiral galaxies, but that's, kind of the, the, the general rotation direction of whether it's galaxies or solar systems, kind of like the, the laws of angular momentum are, sent, again, it depends on your point of view, right? But if you're looking top down, you basically are going to see a counterclockwise rotation. 
So if there was a, a, um, you know, a planet on the other side of N51, kind of opposite the way we were looking, and they look back at N51, then they would see N51 rotating the opposite way, right. correct? It depends on your, your yeah. point of view, right? I'm assuming a top-down gotcha. point of view instead of a bottom-up. Gotcha. Yeah, kind of like how in our solar system, we always kind of think about the planets going counterclockwise, but that's just if we're looking from above. Below, it looks like the opposite. So. Exactly. Uh, let's see. I don't see any other uh, questions at the moment. I um, I was answering some questions in the chat as um, our presenters were, were presenting, so um, I may have answered uh, a, a couple of questions in there. Um, and if we didn't get to them, I may have responded to some of you all um, for a little clarification. So uh, check back through that. Uh, let's see here. Our, we've got two more uh, segments. We're going to go back over to Ann Viano, uh, right over where Jeremy is. And we are going to talk a little bit more about some globular clusters. So Ann, please take it away. Well, hello. So I have turned off the bright white lights in the observatory. Uh, because we're doing some imaging now. So um, I've actually, uh, the clouds are a little bit, but not, not too bad. And I was able to get images of these two clusters. So I'm just going to show you how that works. So I'm sharing a screen here, hopefully. <laughs> um, and you can see a program. It looks like a star map. This is called the Sky X. And it's a program that we use to connect to the telescope, which is behind me and um, uh, allows us to point the telescope and then the dome actually rotates and follows the telescope. So you might notice some constellations on here. This is Ursa Minor here. So Polaris, the pole star is right here at the, the end of the handle. This red line represents the meridian. So this is the north horizon here. Uh, the east horizon is way over on the right side of this window. And right now I'm pointing at a globular cluster M92, but what I wanted to show you first was M13. So I'm gonna, it's very close by. So I just wanna show you how the telescope moves and it's always exciting. So M13 is where the red circle is. The yellow circle is where our telescope is actually pointing at this moment. And so I'm gonna tell the telescope to move and go find uh, M13, and you probably, well, you might be able to see the dome is rotating a little bit, and um, the telescope moved. I can hear it here in the observatory. Uh, unfortunately, the slit is off to in front of me, so I can't rotate the camera around. But now that the telescope is pointing at this object, I would go ahead and take a picture of it, and I've actually already done that to save us time tonight. I took about a 20 second exposure of this globular cluster. And here it is on the right. This is called the Great Hercules Cluster. It's an incredibly bright globular cluster. Um, you can see a, a lot of nice density in the center and then the density of stars kind of falls off as you go far away from the center. And then I did the same thing, same exposure for that other nearby cluster called M92. And it's here shown on the left side of the screen. And these are both at the same magnification um, on the screen. So you can get a sense of how much larger M13 on the right is in the sky than M92 on the left. Uh, this is a 20 inch telescope, has great capabilities, but we have a monochromatic camera. So if we want to get a really pretty color image, we would have to take pictures through different color filters and then combine those images. And we would also want to calibrate our images and that would get rid of these kind of looks like hoof prints almost. Um, those are just due to calibration effects that we need to get rid of. Um, you can see them there a little bit better, just dust and things. But we can get rid of those and we can end up with a really pretty picture. Um, but I, and I'll show you that here in a sec, not of these particular clusters. Uh, there we go. So this is an image that I took a couple of weeks ago of M3, the, the cluster that John was just talking about. And this one has been properly calibrated and we've done it through the different color filters. So this is that cluster we just heard about a little while ago, about 32,000 light years away. It has the Barnard's variable star in it. I'm not sure exactly which side of the image it's on. I was trying to compare uh, a minute ago. Um, it's 
above the galactic plane. Remember I told you the, the globular clusters hang out in the halo of the galaxy. They don't wanna be in the disk where all the excitement is. They hang out in the halo. And this cluster is about 11 billion years old and has maybe 500,000 stars. The ones that I just took a picture of, you just saw a real live image of those clusters, uh, as live as can be with this telescope. We had M13, the great Hercules cluster. Uh, again, hundreds of thousands of stars in this cluster. This, this cluster is about 12 billion years old. And again, from edge to edge, or the size of the, the glob in globular, is about on the order of 100 light years across. So that's a large object in space, much larger than a solar system. M92, the one that appeared smaller in my image, uh, would look like this. These are beautiful images, I think, both from amateur astronomers. Uh, this cluster is 26,000 light years away, so roughly the same distance. Uh, again, on the order of hundreds of thousands of stars. But what's unique about M92 is that its age is roughly 14 billion years. And that is the estimated age of the universe. So this cluster is very old. And it, in fact, it may be the oldest globular cluster ever discovered. So I find that kind of interesting. And that's all I wanted to say in this portion. I'm glad I was able to show you some actual images that we just took minutes ago with our telescope. Um, uh, luckily, we have some clear skies tonight. Well, all right, Ann. I believe Billy has stepped out for just a moment, and I think he's back. back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, well, thank you very much, Ann. Uh, let's see, I don't think we have any questions at the moment. So we are going to move on to our final presentation. We're going to go back over to Middle Tennessee and visit with John Kramer again, uh, who's going to finish our program with uh, one more globular cluster I think you're going to enjoy. So John, take it away. All right. Well, yeah, we are clouded out, so we can't get live, but I have a relatively fresh image, again, just taken from the other day that we'll like to show. So I thought I'd show you about where we were looking in the night sky. This is that free program called Stellarium. If you were to go outside and look towards the east of southeast area, M3 is about 11 or 12 degrees above Arcturus, which is right here. So Arcturus is this bright star and you can see it about, oh, 11 or 12 degrees above. We're gonna go ahead and take a gander at one open or a globular cluster that's actually pretty close, but much dimmer from M3, NGC 5466. And if, if we can go ahead and get that to be clicking on it, I can't quite click on it for some reason at the moment. So what it will do, let's just go right to our image and check out. So this was taken on, uh, let's see, 513. So just a couple of weeks ago, again, we took a fresh image, uh, again, with the same equipment, same telescope, C8, uh, et cetera, with the color cam. And now take a look at this open cluster. And if you recall the, the um, in fact, Anne had a good comparison there between M92 and M13. You saw how tightly um, condensed M92 was. So that's like really low on the classification scale globular clusters. I don't know the number offhand. Um, but then you had kind of M13 sitting there a little bit uh, looser and broader. Again, don't know the classification of M13 offhand either, but NGC 5466, considerably dimmer than those objects. But look at how much looser this particular globular cluster is. In fact, this class of globular cluster is class 12. So it does not have a noticeable core to, to it that you can go ahead and pick up. And I'll do a little bit of a zoom in here with that. And you can kind of see there's not really a whole lot of centralization uh, to the core of this particular globular cluster. So um, I wanted to go ahead and get try to see if I can get the magnitude of it real quick. So let me just look that up. Um, 
here is our website, by the way, the Bernard Seaford Astronomical Society. And of course, you can see by the clear sky clock, it'll get clear, oh, uh, a little bit in the morning time, but right now it, it's not so clear. So NGC 5466 is what we are looking for or looking at here on our view. And it's about magnitude 10.5. So it's um, our previous object, M3, was considerably brighter at magnitude 6, uh, 6.3. And this one is uh, considerably dimmer, but still one that you can go out with a decent sized telescope from a good dark location and try to uh, nab yourself. So there's everyone's homework and observing projects after tonight's virtual star party is to go out and try to find all these objects that we've talked about tonight. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And um, uh, I wanted to show you this particular one because it's kind of off the beaten path of a Messier object. And it does showcase the different classes. And you can really start to see the personality of these different globular clusters. They're really fascinating and cool to look at and to track down for yourself. And none of them are the same. They all have these different uh, characteristics. And uh, some even have, well, that Bernard's variable star in it. So uh, that's uh, for time. I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap it on this object for tonight. All right. Well, thank you, John. That was a great way to, to end our presentations. Um, I think, let's see. Let me look back to our, um, our questions here. Actually, there was a question about if there are channels on YouTube that everyone is from. So, John, you may want to elaborate on yours. I know that, uh, Jeremy, you definitely have some as well. Adam or Ann, if you have some, uh, please let us know. Yeah, our, yeah. Our YouTube, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Oh, uh, yeah. My channel is, uh, you can find it just at the eyepiece. Um, I broadcast whenever there's a clear sky. Uh, and uh, all my equipment's working because <laughs> that's important as well. Uh, and you can go there and I have a number of uh, recorded sessions on there. So you can check out everything that I've done previously. I mean, it covers everything from solar all the way up to galaxies. So go ahead there, Jeremy. <laughs> Thanks, John. At the eyepiece, subscribe. Ours is, um, where is it? Right here. At Memphis Astron Society, we've got... All of our previous recorded me meetings on there, we've been virtual since March of last year. So our last 13 or 14 meetings have all been virtual and recorded via Zoom. Had some excellent talks. And we've also got um, some other things, including footage from our star parties and then also a series called Telescope Tips. So if anyone needs some assistance with telescopes or eyepieces, we've got some videos on that as well. At Memphis Astron Society. John, did you want to do a screen share? Because I think you just pulled up a, a slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, we can, uh, hopefully that's coming through pretty good there. Yeah. It's just yeah. at the eyepiece and at the bottom, all one word at the eyepiece. So just give okay. you a little hand there. Thank you. Um, Ann or Adam, did you all have any that you wanted to share with us? Um, but we have a uh, YouTube channel as well uh, through Bays Mountain Park and Planetarium. Uh, just search for Bays Mountain Park, um, and it's the official site. Um, a lot of people post videos that they shoot at the park, but ours is a mix of not only astronomy, uh, education, but also nature. Um, the latest was uh, three short videos about black bears. So... Some interesting stuff. Yeah, and you didn't have any visiting you tonight, correct? No, but I do have my flashlight <laughs> just in case I, to spot them. So I'm ready, yeah. I'm listening for noises. <laughs> okay. Um, and did you have any that you wanted to share? Uh, no, we are not on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Come to Rhodes College and you can visit us in person. There we go. Um, and I'll, I'll finish it up. Um, so we've got all of our YouTube videos on a playlist. Uh, just, for, uh, just search for the handle at Dire Observers. Uh, that's also our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter. So um, you know, we're pretty easy to find on YouTube as well. Uh, let me look through here if there are any final questions. Uh, doesn't look like it. I, 
like I mentioned before, I've been answering some of the, the quick questions that came through uh, while everyone was presenting. So um, I guess with that, does anybody have any final thoughts or comments on anything that we've uh, spoken about tonight? Again, check out the conjunction of Mercury and Venus next week. I wouldn't get my hopes up. The one thing about those planets so low on the horizon is um, not only do you need, obviously, clear skies, but typically atmospheric turbulence so low on the horizon, you're probably just going to see a fuzzy blob. I did. I, I was fortunate enough to see Mercury last week from our, our, one of our observing sites at Shelby Farms. You could actually see it as a um, like almost like a first quarter phase, kind of like what you see when you see a half moon. Mercury was in that phase last week and I could slightly discern it. But again, you get you see a lot of atmospheric turbulence and light distortion. So you've really got to use your imagination a little bit, but it is a thrill to see. If you ever get a chance to see Venus through a telescope, it will be an incredible thrill to see kind of a silver crescent or half phase. Highly recommend it. And actually, I'll just make two comments on that. First of all, um, you know, talking about looking at uh, Mercury, yes, it, it's very hard to see that phase, especially when it's getting pretty low in the sky. But one thing you may also want to do if you are observing Mercury with a telescope is just sit there and watch it for a few minutes. Just keep your eye at the eyepiece because every now and then you'll get these little, typically short periods of time where the atmosphere gets a little calm for you. And then all of a sudden, things look momentarily clearer for you. I've seen that many, many times. So, um, you know, just give it a few minutes and enjoy the view and really appreciate what you're, you're looking at. Um, and then also regarding Jeremy's comment about looking at Venus, I agree, Venus is incredible to see, especially when it gets uh, to be a beautiful crescent phase. Um, and tying back to uh, one of the topics of uh, one of John's presentations tonight, Edward Emerson Barnard, um, like he mentioned, he's got a lot of things named after him. He's made, he made a tremendous number of discoveries in his career. Um, he is also the, the person who discovered the fifth moon of Jupiter back in 1892. Uh, the first four were discovered by Galileo in 1610, the fifth by Edward Emerson Barnard when he was in, in California at Lick Observatory in 1892. And it'd be the last time anybody would actually look into a telescope and discover a new moon just with their eye orbiting around a planet. So that got Barnard a lot of notoriety, really got his name spread around the world. Uh, but when he, was, uh, when he was younger and was able to get his first telescopes were actually, which were actually manufactured from spyglass lenses and basically crude tubes, uh, one of the, the people that he worked with at the photography studio um, here in Nashville had actually built him a small telescope. And that was when he got his first glimpse of Venus and it was in a beautiful crescent phase. And in his biography, uh, Barnard remarks that that view of Venus uh, was more profound to him, uh, had more of an effect on him than when he discovered the fifth moon of Jupiter. So that tells you a little something about the, the beauty of, of Venus. So I would definitely try to check that out, um, especially as we get towards the end of the year and we see that beautiful phase. So um, anybody else? Sorry, I took a little bit uh, longer there than I anticipated. Uh, oh, uh, we do have a question here. What does Jeremy Veldman's t-shirt say? Well, appropriately enough, it is globular clusters. <laughs> so on the front, I have... Um, M13 and M92, which my esteemed colleague Ann Viano, and also I believe John talked about earlier. And then on the back of my t-shirt, I've got one that's maybe even more famous than that. And that is uh, Omega Centauri. And if you talk to anyone, uh, it's really hard to spot Omega Centauri in the Northern hemisphere, but it's, it's low on the horizon. This time of year, if you, if you get a clear view, uh, unimpeded by trees, and you can catch Omega Centauri. That is a spectacular globular cluster. So it's another one to consider checking out. But globular clusters. All righty. Well, anybody else? I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat. So 
Well, I can say that this was a fabulous program. I want to thank all of our presenters. Again, Adam Thans from uh, Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium, uh, Jeremy Veldman uh, with the Memphis Astronomical Society, Ann Viano with uh, Rhodes College, who's also a member of Memphis Astronomical Society, and then last but certainly not least, uh, John Kramer uh, from the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues, Helen Morissette, who is behind the scenes, kind of monitoring questions, making sure everything was working out, and also um, uh, Brian Smokler with VU News and Communications. So um, we're still planning on continuing doing these virtual programs. Um, Dyer Observatory is still closed to the public. Hopefully we will uh, be changing that, uh, but if we do, um, and hopefully we'll be changing that soon, I should say. If we do, we will post that information to our homepage, which is dire.vanderbilt.edu. But uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, at least we are planning on at least doing uh, these, these programs until we can reopen. And who knows, we may continue doing the virtual aspect um, or the virtual star parties, uh, even when we have the, uh, the in-person um, uh, events here uh, in the future. So. Um, Thank you all for joining us tonight. I certainly had a lot of fun. I hope you guys did too. Hope you guys learned a lot. So um, if you have any additional questions, you can always um, uh, email us uh, here at the Dyer Observatory or you've, uh, you've heard the YouTube channels that we have for our, our presenters this evening. So you can always uh, send them a, a quick message uh, over YouTube or contact their organization. So um, thanks again for everything. And I look forward to uh, seeing you all virtually next month, hopefully in person, who knows? So y'all have a great night and a great weekend.